Hi, I'm Nancy Davidoff Kelton. I am the playwright who wrote Finding Mr. Reitstein, and um, it is one of the two winners of the Long Beach um, Playhouse New Works um, Festival, and it will be read April 1st. I hope to see you there, and um, I'm very excited, a little nervous um, to be there, and I hope you are just excited. Please listen to this interview um, about my play. Um, I, it was a lot of fun, even though my earring fell off. Um, it was a lot of fun being here and talking to you all. Um, I think that the, the staged reading of Finding Mr. Reitstein is going to be um, as much, if not more, fun. So as a, my parents were theater buffs, and I grew up in Buffalo, and there was one legit theater there called Studio Arena. Jane Keeler started it. And they used to go to Toronto to the theater. And then as I got a little older, they took me. And um, in 1956, which lets you know my age, when I was nine, um, we went on my first trip to New York and we saw three shows. And the first one we saw was The Diary of Anne Frank which I had read in school. And there wasn't a central aisle, there was aisles on the sides and we were like in the third row center. And after the play, and there was a standing ovation, my sister went up one aisle and my parents went up the other aisle and the whole audience was going up. And I was about the only person still in the audience. I was on the stage in the attic with Otto Frank holding the diary. I was so there, I couldn't get up. I was glued to my seat. I And we saw, then we saw the most happy fella because we couldn't get into My Fair Lady and No Time for Sergeants, which didn't quite compare to the, the diary of Anne Frank. So each year my parents brought me to New York and I heard the names Neil Simon and Mike Nichols for the whole car ride, nine hours from Buffalo to New York, they were one person. And I come from a funny family. And um, I don't know if they knew who the playwright was and who the director was, but I saw Barefoot right away, Barefoot in the Park, Elizabeth Ashley and Robert Redford. And I saw The Odd Couple and we kept going. And then 1960 or 61, my father went with my mother to New York and they saw The Miracle Worker. And my father came home and he said, what are you doing the next three Saturdays? I said, why? He said, I want to take you back to New York to see Patty Duke and Anne Bancroft and the Miracle Worker. The same thing happened again. I could not get out of my seat. And both main characters, you know, Anne Frank and um, Helen Keller, they were about my age. And I totally connected. I totally connected to the theater and kept going back to New York and knew I wanted to move here. One reason was to see a lot of shows, which I did and which I still do. I just, you know, my husband and I walk to the theater, whether it's off Broadway or Broadway. I live on 16th Street and it's such a, and then the walk home is about a half hour and we're still talking about the play and people, some of the Rongstein men I went out with before I met my husband, would say to me, we can stop talking about the show now. You know, <laughs> I could never stop talking about the show. And I never wanted to be a performer, but I did, I like scribbling on my bed. And in my 30s, I attempted to write a couple plays and I started showing them around. I had them bound where Neil Simon had his plays bound. I thought that would help. <laughs> and um I had, I was divorced from my first husband. I had to figure out how to write and make a living. So it wasn't going to be playwriting. And I wrote for magazines and I wrote books. And I was very fortunate that I write very, very personally. I, I don't know if you've read my play, very personally. And I have written about my family, about some of the awful men who um, I have been with um, between marriages, um, and, uh, you know, everything that's going on with me about my teaching. And I felt very lucky writing about it. But my, I'm always, I was always looking at the theater. I was always looking there. I just have always loved the theater. And it was, it, it was, it's what we talked about in my house. You know, and, and the musicals too. I, there wasn't a time in my living room that the King and I, Oklahoma, or My Fair Lady were not playing. So, and you know, there I was.
growing up in Buffalo, we had a lot of snow. And on Saturdays, my father and I used to go to his office to take supplies. And there were always legal pads for me. And I couldn't wait to get home and curl up on my bed. And in second grade, I wrote a poem about snow. I remember eight, I'm not going to recite it, um, but, but <laughs> um, unless you want me to, but, but um, I wrote a poem about snow and I showed it to Miss Carlson, my teacher, and she called my mother in and said, I think Nancy can write. And that was very exciting. And I just, it is usually what was going on with me. And when my, gr my grandma died and I wrote a poem to her and my other grandma died six days later, and I didn't have the, the same strong attachment to her, and I couldn't write the poem and I, 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 the same kind with the same kind of feeling. So I always wrote what was going on inside of me. You know, my mother was ill when I was growing up. And that's a, the thrust of the play. She struggled with mental illness, and I was always writing about that for myself. Where's mom, you know? I don't under I don't understand it. Did I do that? And, and it came from a pretty deep place, not knowing that early on. I loved writing. The theater experience is, I guess it's there's a magic to it. I I I think that the the actors totally, if they're um, enhancing the dialogue connect with the audience and are enhancing the playwright's words and I think if it's a good play, it's relatable for the most part. I mean, I write about family and a lot of dysfunction. And I think I, I, don't, I just saw Mike Birbiglia and I saw uh, Danny Burstein and Nathan Lane in um, Pictures from Home. And they came to the edge of the stage and talked to us, talked to the audience. And I felt like they were talking right to me. I felt there was such an immediacy. I'm not a big television person. Um, I, I love watching documentaries. I, I, I don't love it. I love good movies. I love great acting. I, um, you know, I like the opening scene of The Godfather with Brando eating, petting the cat, and and uh, 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 being Don Corleone. Um, but I think you make a connection, a good actor, with the deep part of him or herself. And then they make it with the audience. I've written seven books, and the first four were biographies. One on Helen Keller when she was a child. They were all on great people when they were children and what provided a clue to their later greatness. I was teaching second grade at the time, and I couldn't find anything. They were very straight biographies. And the kids were very bored by them. I kept going to the library and trying to find something. So... I said, why don't I, this took a lot of chutzpah. I think what gets me into things is some chutzpah. Um, why don't I write something that they can connect to? And so I took experiences in the lives of Helen Keller, Harry Truman, the Wright brothers, um, and Harriet Tubman, and which provided a clue to who they became. And before I started sending these out to an agent and then to, to editors, it was very hard and still is very hard to get an agent. Uh, I read them to the, my second grade kids who did not have a long attention span and they liked it. And one day I forgot a page at home and they said, oh, what happens? What happens? So I think I knew I was on to telling a story about a kid. I mean, Harry, Harry Tubman was, he wasn't a baseball player, but he was the umpire. He was a good decision maker. And uh, Helen Keller, it was when she said water, you know, at the pump. And, you know, they were each, um, Harriet Tubman got hit in the head, but I told this by a slave owner. And she said, I'm going to do something when I get older. Um, and the Wright brothers were doing something with the sled. I found these stories very compelling and I got it to a very, using a limited you know, number of words um, for young kids. I wrote a book on writing because I've been a writing teacher for 40 years and writing from personal experience. Um, that was a, a grew out of an uh, article I wrote for Writer's Digest. I wrote a humor book on dating, gallows humor, of course. <laughs> um, then I wrote my memoir, Finding Mr. Wrightstein, from which I adapted the play. And the memoir... My memoir, Finding Mr. Wrightstein. Um, after my mother died, 
I wrote about her illness and how it impacted on me, both as a child, feeling unlovable, and then in my adult relationships. Why am I the only person who doesn't have the gene to sustain a relationship? I couldn't. And I was writing about dating. And I was writing about my dad, who I was attached to, but there was a price with that. And um, somehow I put that all together, was who I was as a little girl, why it's taking a reasonably smartish, you know, person, decent enough company, having such a tricky time with a partnership. And I put it together and I thought both of those topics, not having perfect parents, um, which everybody in the world, I know one person who didn't relate and she didn't stay in my class very long. Um, <laughs> and, and struggling in relationships and, you know, is it about them? Is it about me? What's going on? I put it all together and I typically see some humor in the pain and I started sending it out and there, there was my memoir. And when I launched Finding Mr. Reitstein, the book, I had the best time reading sections with dialogue. I think that if I, um, I love dialogue. If I didn't write dialogue, I probably would, I hear voices. I think I'd be in a padded cell. Um, <laughs> I, it's my favorite thing. I, describing things is more work for me than having, having my characters um, talk to each other. And I know playwriting is so much more than that. The first piece I ever sold 50 years ago was called The Teacher's Lunchroom. And it was about two first grade teachers um, discussing their classes and the reading um, in each of their classes and their pettiness a little bit in the teacher's lunchroom. But the whole piece was in dialogue. And it's the most fun I have writing. Of course, playwriting is so much more difficult than just, you know, it's what to take out and this and this. I'm learning so much in this process, but it's fun, the the, the writing of dialogue. I, I don't know if it was a need, but I, I tell my students, and I feel the same way about me, that if there's not a sense of urgency, I, I you shouldn't write it. There has to be some kind of urgency. I, I just recently lost a friend and... Um, the end of her life, I, you know, I, I'm very pulled into our last few visits and I wrote about it and I just had the piece published. And the writing about my mother and, and having a fractured relationship and making peace with her and um, finding a place for her to live after my father died, I think they're very universal things, mothers and daughters and the struggle and then what to do with mom when she can't take care of herself? Do I take her in? Do I put her in a home? The guilt about putting her in a home, you know, all those things. I was writing bits and pieces of that in the memoir and then making short plays and having readings. And people came up to me after I'm going through that with my mother. You made me cry. This is what I'm going through. And I think what I say is very relatable, you know, instead of staying too long with men who are not going to be keepers. It, it just all came together. And I wanted to tell the story. And I'm not, I'm not, I can't write about other, I mean, fi finding Mr. Reitstein is somewhat fictionalized. And um, I, I went deeper than I did in the memoir. But I think my story is a story that is very, very, the, more, the deeper I go and the more it, personal I am, the more universal it seems to me that it is. So Joanna, um, age 50-ish, is divorced and her father has died and um, he's still her main man. She can't quite go forward. And he filled up a lot of space for a lot of reasons. It's partly her and partly the two of them. And she wants to move on. And her mother's in a home. And um, she goes out with people. She goes to her therapist to find out why is, why is my life not exactly working. And 
Um, there's flashbacks to who her father and mother were with her, and they both put her down um, in the looks department. So she didn't think that she um, was very pretty, and that was difficult. And she had to sort out what was them. I guess we all do. And I think, what's what's our parents and what is us? And what do we carry? And we do carry so much of our past with us, you know, and the stuff, what's self-sabotaging, you know, until we work it out. Oh, they had a problem and I am lovable. And it, it takes a lot, a lot of work to, to, uh, to find oneself and to love oneself enough, I think, to love another person. And I think that's the story I wanted to tell. I want them to all call their artistic director friends and <laughs> I, <laughs> and producer friends and um, say, when, when are we going to see the production? Because I want to buy two rows for my friends. I want the audience to say after, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. And the, the, the real truth is, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry at that line. It touched me and it amused me, you know, and, and I want them to say, yeah, I went through that with my daughter. I went through that with my mother. I went through that till I met the guy I was supposed to, you know, be with. I, I it took me a long time to see myself, but I want, how to, I want them to say, how did you know what I was feeling? It felt like you were walking in my shoes. I felt like I was walking in yours. I made a connection with Joanna. I hope that there is a reaction. I hope that sometimes there's a gasp or a chuckle where I might not think there would be. I, when I was talking to um, Meredith, the director, um, you know, she said there was a line. It was so tiny. And she said, but it was it showed the change in Joanna and her mother's relationship. And I am so touched that she found that, that the tiny, li the, the tiny lines show the, th the arc, the th you know, things changing in the play. I want to feel that the audience is feeling it and, and getting it and saying, oh, my God, she's like writing about me, you know, or the, how'd she know? I, I, I want to have that feeling. I want to feel, feel that I'm connecting. I fell in love with Long Beach um, Playhouse when I sent it to them for a lot of reasons. Um, and I thought they were, uh, if you want me to tell you specifically, I found, I, I, I wanted to go to a New Works Festival and not, and there didn't seem to be restrictions. I didn't have to be a California resident or a certain age or have a certain theme, which some theaters do. And it said New Works. Then I wrote and asked if I could send two 10 minute sections that, that work and the full length play. And that same day, Jane Nunn wrote me back the very same day, send us your full length work. And I thought that was very responsive and very respectful of the writer. And I, fe I, fe I have felt since that contact that Long Beach Playhouse has been very respectful of the writer. And then um, Madison, uh, Mooney wrote me and said, this is what works if we accept your play. And then she said, we welcome you to our family. That There was no acceptance then, but it was just, we welcome you. I thought that was very lovely and welcoming. I, I A combination of the pandemic and who I am, I love, I, I am very attracted to warmth. And I felt Long Beach Playhouse people were very warm. Then Sean, um, Sean Gray wrote me and told me what to expect. And I've written him a few times, like he had a re asking him to repeat that. And he, he also wrote me back the same day. And I think my questions were a little nudgy. I was probably, I, I, besides being very excited, I'm a little nervous. And I let him know that, but he never, he didn't make me feel that I was a nudge. He just answered them. And everybody has been so, so lovely. And I felt that the description of what they expected was just welcoming. I write a catalog description for the new school where I teach. It's a little different from other writing classes um, descriptions and I get warm 
students. I get students who feel engaged to me right away. And I felt this engagement with Long Beach Playhouse. First and foremost, I think they will be entertained. I do. I think they will walk away um, just saying that was a really good night out. And I hope um, she has a bigger production. I would see it again or I would tell my friends about it. I think they will be enlightened a bit that um, they can be entertained and enlightened at the same time. And I think that they will feel some sort of connection. I mean, you said it about you, you like Wendy Wasserstein, I connected with her immediately with all her plays. I feel the same way. Um, and, uh, you know, all the plays I like, I, I feel like I feel the audience will connect. They will have a good time, first and foremost. They will say it's much better than staying home. It's much better than watching da, da, da. Oh, how come I haven't heard about her before? It's funny how, you know, she can write about illness um, and even make it funny. I also must say that my play is a lot, and it's um, about having a, a person with a mental illness in a family and how it impacts on the family and how it impacts on the children. And that is always underlying my play. And I do think that many families do not want to deal with mental illness or still in this day and age have a problem with psychotherapy. And if I get some people to maybe look at themselves a little bit more in, in the process of being entertained, I would be delighted to have them look at, oh, she didn't not, she loved me. She did the best she could. She had an illness. And that's why she was the way she was. It wasn't about me. And the mental illness within the family and within ourselves, I think, I hope it continues to be looked at, you know, without, without any struggle, you know, without, without anything. In yeah. New York, there's, there's more therapists than there are people in therapy. I mean, it's kind of a way of life. I think people have, if they, if people who get in touch with themselves have stories to tell. And I, and, and if my telling my story about having a mother who was ill and it impacted on me and it impacted on my sister and how I viewed men and how I viewed love, Oh, she can write about that. You don't have to um, be have a terminal illness, and you don't have to have sexual or physical abuse to write a story. You know, you there. I th I think many people have stories to tell, and maybe it will empower them to tell their stories and certainly listen to one that's entertaining. I think Long Beach Playhouse is welcoming. I think there is a respect for writers. I think I don't really know playwrights, although I'm in a, a, a on the periphery of a group now. And one of the topics is to talk about rejections. And some of the rejects, some people don't get rejected, they just get ignored. And that is one of the things that happens. And if and if Long Beach Playhouse was going to reject me, they were very kind in the process, reaching back to me right away. I mean, nobody reaches back to nobody's reached back to me right away, except my daughter's pediatrician forty years ago. You know what was the? They were they were they couldn't each each of them Jane and Madison and and um, Sean and now Meredith. Everybody's so lovely, like. I am a person there, and I'm not sure that writing is given its due in this country. It certainly is in England and in Europe, but I'm not sure it is here. I, I'm not sure that people have such a profound. Writing's really hard. I'm doing it. I'm being. I've I've been published now for 50 years in magazines, books. This is a brand new path for me. It's harder than it. It makes all of those seem easy, and they're not. I collected 156 rejections before I sold an essay. And in the playwriting world, writing the play is hard. Getting it to a person who think who responds to you. And then if they sometimes 
the rejection is a no. And then two days later, would you like to donate to our theater? Um, you know, and it, it, it feels so, it feels bad. It just feels bad. I think my earring just went some flying. So I'm taking the other one off. Um, um, you know, a, a rejection is, is fine. I, you have to get used to it. A student of mine got upset about a rejection. I said, it's like being a boxer and not expecting to get punched. If you're going to go into the arena Revising and revising and revising and revising. And yes, one of the things I do hope to get out of the reading in Long Beach is to hear what needs to be revised. I mean, that's I, I'm a born reviser and that I love revising. Making something go from 106 pages to 90 is going to be great fun. And so I want to hear what needs tightening or what needs to be fleshed out. I, th I think the Long Beach Playhouse um really wants to work with playwrights and actors and directors it's the feeling i'm getting i think i have a third eye and a third ear and long beach play has totally turned me on everything about it so far very welcoming when i was in california um three weeks ago babysitting i went from uh pacific palisades to, we took a ride my husband and i went to the theater and it was 4 30 and the person who didn't open the box it wasn't time to open the box office yet they showed me around and it was very nice they just it, it, it's oh come on in there's that feeling so i we're all on the same side it doesn't feel anything like a business there's nothing um that it's it's just so respectful and i they just I feel like they like writers and I think they love and directors. I've been having a wonderful email exchange with uh, Meredith Miranda, who's um, directing it. I don't know if you know her, but she had an audition and she auditioned many people. And I've given her a couple suggestions on what I wanted. I'm going to go to a rehearsal, but it's so come on, you know, we all want to do this. And what a nice feeling. Keep the theater alive. I think that to keep the theater alive, people understand that it would help the community to do such things. I mean, to give to to uh, donate to the theater, and the fact that there is no charge is very, very lovely. I hope that the audience is huge. Um, I hope that they're standing room only. I'll stand. Um, uh, <laughs> um, and I, I think that people should do whatever they can to keep the theater alive. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, I think that theater, unlike television, which is not, is a, a derivative of other things and, and they copy and they reboot and theater is fresh and it's new. And, and it's, I think where you're going to get innovation and innovative voices and people wanting to do things differently. And I don't know, I listen to actors, um, in documentaries now. And Al Pacino, um, I was listening to him. He was very happy doing off, 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 off Broadway when he first started. He just wanted to share, you know, enhance the, the, the playwright's vision. And I love hearing that, you know, I, it's, it's so immediate and it's so, it's so human. It's so, it's so, human and it's so um i think it's so much more innovative and i think we need that more than ever i want people to maybe look more at their families their relationships their partnerships their children everything every aspect of it the, um and think about it more i think that in the worst in, in the most difficult um situations Having an illness in the family, a loss, a death. There's um, some death in this play. I th I mean, my opening line, people will hear it. The standing room only audience on um, <laughs> on April 1st. Um, I, I, see, I saw the humor in death. And I think, I, I think having a sense of humor is what keeps us going for a while, a passion and a sense of humor. So I hope people see that I saw that in, in things and that they will look at things that way and feel free to express what's in their heart and their soul. I'm Nancy Davidoff Kelton. I won um, the Long Beach New Works Festival 2023 along with Chuck Cummings, 
And my play will be read, a staged reading, April 1st at 7 o'clock. I would love to see you there. I'd love to meet you during the intermission or after. I would love to hear your feedback at the uh, panel discussion after with the cast, the director, uh, uh, drama critic, and me. I would love to hear what you think needs tightening, where I went on too long, where you want more, where you say this worked beautifully, or I don't get why you stuck that in. I am very open um, I am a born reviser, and I think this is a beginning. I would like to come back and present you with a production, and I would love to shake your hand and see you there and hear a lot of what you have to say and who you are and what you do, and the more the merrier. I don't think we're going to drink in the theater, but we can hold up our pretend glasses and um, share a moment. I will see you at the theater April 1st at 7 I'll probably be there um, a little bit early, changing seats and saving one for my daughter who's going to arrive a little bit later and saving one for a cousin. I, I don't know people in the Long Beach area, so I'd like to meet you. So come over and I'll wave to you. Um, if you're watching this now, you'll recognize me. I don't know if I'll have my glasses on. I might be biting my nails a little bit, biting my fingers, um, but I would love to meet you there. Um, and I'd love to, I'd love to hear your feedback and I'd love to hear who you are. So I'll see you April 1st at seven. And then again at nine when the play is over and then after the talk back. Thank you so much for listening and see you soon.